So for those of you who I've not had the privilege of meeting or talking with, my name is Marianne Felice. I'm a past program director of SAM and a past president of SAM, and I've been a member since before some of you were even born. I am certain of that. <laughs> and these sessions in which we do the oral history of SAM by interviewing a key figure in the field of adolescent medicine and health um, was previously started by and it was run by a wonderful person, Dick Brown, uh, from um, San Francisco um, Hospital. And last year he did his last one. I think he's been doing it for about 15 to 18 years. And he asked me if I would take over. So I doubt that I will be able to ever fill the shoes of somebody like Richard Brown, but I'm going to do my very best. And um, the first person that I get to interview for this is Abigail English, whom many of you probably already know. But Abigail English um, makes me very, very proud that we are a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary organization because she's one of the few members of SOM. Am I saying that correctly now? Yeah. One of the few members of SOM um, who's uh, not a physician or a psychologist or a social worker, but rather she is a practicing attorney. She is a lawyer. I think we have three or four members who are lawyers. Right. She's probably the one who is most well known, of course. Um, she served as SOM's president from 2007 to 2008, another honor for our organization. Some of us who are more senior in the room uh, grew up quoting her and citing her publications on the rights, the legal rights of children and adolescents. And I don't know what we would have done for our grant proposals and everything else if we had not had Abigail to quote from. So today, I hope we can answer the question, how did adolescence and the field of adolescent health and our society get so lucky that we would have among our ranks such a strong advocate for children and adolescents as Abigail English? So Abigail, we're going to start this now. Uh, tell us where you were born and where you grew up and what your parents were like. Thank you, Marianne, and I will certainly do that, but first I want to thank you for giving me this uh, rare opportunity to talk with you and to talk with everyone here in the room. I've really been looking forward to this ever since you issued the invitation, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Yes. They're all looking forward to hearing <laughs> how you came to be, too. So, so I was born in New York City, um, right in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, <laughs> to uh, two parents who had grown up in the Depression, um, who both worked, which was mm. unusual in the 1950s. My mother went back to work full time after about six weeks at Barnard College. And what did I, she do at Barnard College? She was director of student activities. And very, she had gone to Barnard herself. Uh -huh. And she worked there until I was um, Oh, maybe three or four years old, and then she went to work for a foundation in New York City. The Commonwealth. The Commonwealth Fund, right, where she was um, associate director of an international fellowship program, which really it enriched my childhood because she was the sort of person who would invite the international fellows who came through New York to come home and have dinner with us or join us for Thanksgiving or something. So I had an opportunity to meet a lot of people from different parts of the world as a child. And what did your father do? He worked for New York State. Uh, he worked for the insurance department, uh, regulating insurance companies, life insurance companies. And as I recall, you were an only child. I was an only child. Um, and my parents were older when I was born. My mother was almost 40. My father was 40. Again, unusual in the, at that uh, time. Not so unusual today. And uh, they were very devoted and very nurturing parents in a lot of ways. Uh, but as an only child, I had, in some ways, a more solitary childhood than, than I would have with several siblings or even a brother or a sister. So one of the individuals I interviewed uh, as part of uh, this assignment was um, a college roommate of, of Abigail's. Who t and she was from Stan. Oh yes! If I'm going to give, <laughs> wait till I interview you, you can see who I'm going to interview. And she said that. 
<laughs> so uh, her roommate was from Stanford and uh, didn't go home for the holiday. She would go home with Abigail, and, her, she, sa and she said to me, Linda's her name, that her parents were so welcoming and so wonderful and made, uh, made anybody who came home with Abigail uh, very welcome. If they were inviting students home, I can see why that would be a natural for your mom and dad. But where did you go to elementary school? I actually went to a private school in New York City. Um, my parents had grown up in New York, and they had both gone all the way through the New York City public school system. But at the time I was a uh, child ready to start school, they thought, they recognized, I think wisely, that I was shy and that um, I might have gotten lost in the sort of hustle bustle and hurly burly of the New York City schools at the time. And so I went to an all girls, very small private school, which was a place that both gave me a wonderful education and gave me the opportunity to make some friends who've been really lifelong friends. At that time. And besides doing well in grade school and every other school you've gone to, <laughs> as I recall, you were a ballerina then. I was a dancer. I was not actually a ballerina. I was a, uh, yes. I was a, I did modern dance. Ah. And that was something that was offered at the school. Um, they, they invited a teacher to come in a couple of times a week and give us modern dance classes and I loved that and I was extremely fortunate because uh, when I was in the fifth grade our dance teacher was asked by Jose Limon who was a very well-known modern dancer uh, at the time if she would please bring some girls to audition for a dance that he was going to be mounting at the American Dance Festival, which at that time was in New London, Connecticut, over the summer. It was a, it was a uh, revival of a Doris Humphrey dance called Day on Earth. And I auditioned for the part of the little girl in the dance, and I was given the part. And so I had this amazing opportunity to rehearse throughout the spring with Jose Limon and two other dancers from his company. And he was uh, an extraordinary human being, very generous with me, with his time, with his teaching, and a really uh, spectacular example of a human being in the arts who was also um, just a very kind and warm teacher. So I consider this phase of Abigail's life her dance period, okay? <laughs> And I'll explain that later to you as that creative side of hers it was her dance period. So then during adolescence, you went off to a private boarding school in Massachusetts from New York City when you were in 10th grade. I did. I did. And again, this was not a family tradition. I had, I had gone to school with, with girls who had family tradition of going away, and I somehow got the notion that going away to school would be the right thing for me. And with um, some uh, dialogue and persuasion with my parents, uh, we agreed that I would go to Milton in Massachusetts, which I did for the last three years of high school. And again, that was a, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity for me as an only child to spend time in, in sort of closer proximity and living with, daily with um, other uh, adolescents my age. It was also, um, in a way, it was a kind of running away, and that's a strange thing to say because I had very loving parents and uh, they were quite sad to see me go, I think, but I just felt uh, impelled to, to go at that moment in my life. So this was a, this was sort of a an authorized way of running away from home. <laughs> and a protected way <laughs> in a some ways. very protected way of, so of while, running away from home. While you were at Milton Academy, I know you had some experiences that have influenced you even today. Can you tell this group about some of that? Sure. Um, well, I had some extraordinary teachers. So my academic experience there, particularly with some of the teachers I had in um, in English and literature, who taught poetry and fiction, um, had a tremendous influence on me. But I think in terms of my kind of 
life path, one of the things that had the, the most effect or the most powerful effect on me was some volunteer work that I did um, in, my, in my junior year uh, in high school. There was a tutoring program in Roxbury, Massachusetts, and as a several poor of section, us, as a, a poor section, it's a, yes, very quite okay. impoverished, and at the time, pr predominantly African American part of Boston, and uh, several of my classmates and I would go to a church um, there in Roxbury called St. Anne's Episcopal Church uh, once a week and tutor an individual student. There was something very unusual about this tutoring program in that it had been started by and was run by Jonathan Kozol. And some of you may know of Jonathan Kozol as someone who has written some very um, searing books about the educational system in the United States. Well, he was my, he was really my introduction to uh, social services, to uh, eye-opening experiences about how different parts of the American society were living. And I tutored a little girl who was in the fourth grade who uh, lived a few blocks from St. Anne's Church and who was struggling in school but who went to school regularly. And one day she, and she worked hard on her homework and she made progress. I was tutoring her mostly in arithmetic. And one day, I think um, my ride to go back to school was late or something. Anyway, I walked her home to her apartment. And we walked into her apartment, and there was no furniture in the living room. And, and in her parents' home, there would have been these beautiful antiques and this well-preserved place. Right. And you must have been, what, 15 years old, 16? I was 15 years old, 15 or 16 years old. And this little girl, they, there was a living room with no furniture. There was, there was a baby who was in diapers and lying on some newspapers on the floor. And that was my uh, window into this little girl's life. And it made me extraordinarily impressed that she could get up and get dressed and go to school in the morning. But she did. I wonder what happened to that little girl. I wish I knew. I don't know either. But I'm, I'm sure she benefited immensely from that. But for you at that age to have seen that and to have that all resonate must have been very, very important. 